So over the years, the courts, apart from what happened in Trident Insurance, the courts have on occasion questioned the doctrine of privity as well as loosened it in some way. So let's have a look at some examples. First of all, there's Beswick and Beswick. This is a very, very famous case. Um, what happened in this case was that there was um, an uncle and a nephew. And the uncle was called Peter Beswick and the nephew was called John Beswick. And Peter Beswick ran his own company, which was essentially a one-man operation delivering coal. And uh, he was very frail and he had lost his leg uh, through amputation. And so he was thinking of giving his nephew the company. And so they came to an agreement whereby John would take over the company and in consideration of that, he would give Peter a weekly amount of money. Now, the contract also stated that if Peter were to die, John would continue giving a weekly amount of money to Peter's wife. Now, unfortunately, Peter did die and John refused to hand over the weekly amount of money to the wife. The question then, as with pretty much all the cases we've looked at so far, was whether the wife could sue John for the money. And the court said no, because she was not privy to the contract between her husband and the nephew. So once again, the doctrine of privity in force. And this case is noteworthy because Lord Denning wrote in his judgment, dissenting, that indeed there should be a, a possibility for the wife to sue the nephew. So we see some loosening and Lord Denning was often involved with that. For instance, he was involved in the next case as well, Jackson and Horizon Holidays. What happened in this case was that the um, Jacksons had booked a holiday through Mr. Jackson to go to Sri Lanka. Now, when they got to their holiday destination, it, everything was out of place. It was inferior. The hotel wasn't ready. There were a lot of problems. So they tried to sue the um, holiday company for compensation. Now, of course, the compensation was for everyone in the family. But the holiday company said that the contract was merely between Mr. Jackson and the company, so the other members of the family should not be able to sue for compensation. Now, the court held that in this type of scenario, we can overcome the doctrine of privity because it was at least in the contemplation of the parties that when Mr. Jackson booked a holiday, he didn't just book it for himself, he booked it for the whole family, even though he was the person who made the booking and he was the one who paid for the booking. So in this type of scenario, we see some loosening of the doctrine of privity. Now, because of this loosening, in a subsequent case of Woodar Investment and Wimpy Construction, um, parties try to make use of the uh, ratio in Jackson to try and force the same outcome whereby a third party was able to sue because of an association with one of the parties to the contract. Now, the facts and the law of Woodar Investment and Wimpy Construction is very complex, and so we won't get into it at this stage, in particular as it involves terms of contract and other issues which we have not covered on this course yet. However, it is important to note that the court held that where there were commercial agreements there would be no such loosening of the doctrine of privity. So where there were commercial agreements between company A and company B, we couldn't suddenly have company C show up and claim a benefit under that contract, which was between company A and B. So no loosening where commercial agreements are involved. In Obiter, the court did say that the loosening, which we saw in the case of Jackson for the holidays, would also apply to things like taxi rides, and uh, perhaps meals where you go to a restaurant and one person pays, but there's a whole party and what if one of the parties falls ill and wants to sue the restaurant? That sort of scenario, we may be able to overcome the doctrine of privity, but not in commercial agreements. Now, another problem that has always been around and poses a particular issue is the shipment of cargoes. Now, what I mean by that is where you have a shipment of cargo, especially between two, say, different countries, where the consignor, the person who drops off the cargo and gives it to the shipping company, when they do that, the ownership of that cargo then passes to the consignee, who is 
the person who is going to receive the shipment, the container, the boxes, whatever it is, on the other side. However, in between, the shipping company is in possession of that container or those boxes. So problems would frequently arise where the goods are handed over to the shipping company, then they are lost or broken or something happens with them while they're in transit, and then the consignee, the person who is supposed to receive the goods, doesn't have a claim because they don't have a contract with the shipping company. The contract with the shipping company is between the person who delivered the goods and the shipping company. So this obviously posed many major problems. And in the Alba Zero, it was resolved that where it was within the contemplation of the parties that the proprietary interest may be transferred. So where the shipping company would be aware, where it was within their contemplation, that the container or the boxes, the shipment that they received would pass in terms of the proprietary interest of that would pass to someone else, the um, person on the other end who was going to receive the goods, then that person could also sue upon such a contract. So in essence, what um, happened here is that the courts got rid of a black hole, a legal black hole, where the recipient cannot sue because they don't have a contract, and the um, consignor, the person who delivered the cargo, they can't sue either because they haven't suffered any damages. That's that's really the, uh, the trouble, because when uh, they deliver the goods and they get paid, and then the uh, proprietary interest in those goods passes to the buyer, well, how can the seller say that they suffered any damages? So um, this was a big problem, and obviously that's uh, fully resolved now. Thus far, we've looked at the doctrine of privity, the fact that it's firm, and the fact that in some very limited ways it has been loosened. Now let's move on to look at the outright exceptions. The most important exception to the doctrine of privity is agency. So where there is agency, the doctrine of privity may be overcome and third parties may be able to sue. Probably the most important case in this respect is the case of Scruttons and Midland Silicones. What happened in that case was that um, Scruttons had contracted with a shipping company to ship some um, chemicals and they were going to be shipped to a company called Midland Silicones. Now unfortunately, the shipping company had hired a stevedore company to unload their ship at the port of, destina uh, of destination and unfortunately the stevedores had damaged the goods. Now this is somewhat similar to the Euromedon case which we discussed when we talked about consideration. The problem in Scruttons was that the bill of lading, that means the contract between Scruttons and the shipping company didn't mention anything about third parties, it didn't talk about parties such as the stevedores. So when the stevedores were sued, they sought to rely on the exclusion clause in the main contract, which again was the one between Scruttons and the shipping company. However, as it turns out, they were not able to do so because they were not privy to that contract. So they were not able to rely on the exclusion clause of a contract which was not their contract. Now we remember that in the Euromedon, there was reliance, but only because that contract between the shipping company and the seller of the goods had mentioned agency and had mentioned the fact that third parties may be able to rely on the clauses of that contract. So that was not the case in Scruttons and hence that um, was unsuccessful. However, in coming to their decision, the court came up with something that we know as the Lord Reed Rule. This is a four-stage test to see when and if agency may apply. So it didn't actually apply in the case at hand, but Lord Reed came up with a four-stage rule of when it could apply. First of all, the contract, the original main contract, so in this case the contract between the sellers and the shipping company, has to make reference to third parties. The contract also has to make reference to agency. That means that the contract must clearly state that the shipping company may act as an agent for those third parties. 
Also, the third parties must have given authority to the agent, to the shipping company, in that they knew of there being such a clause. They knew that they may be a third party and that the shipping company may act as an agent. And fourthly, and of course this was one of the issues in the Euromedon case, the test says that consideration is not a problem. So you have to overcome any problems associated with consideration. If you can fulfill those four criteria, then you may have a case of agency. And again, what agency basically means is that through an agent, a third party may be able to sue upon a contract. For the sake of completeness, now that we're talking about agency, we should mention the case of Adler and Dixon, which is also known as the Himalaya, which of course was the name of the ship involved in that case. Now what happened in that case was that this ship was a cruise ship, so we're not talking about shipment of cargoes, and the passenger was thrown off the gangway. Now, the contract between the cruise line and the passenger excluded or limited liability in such cases. So the cruise ship passenger could not sue for as much as he might have wanted to. However, the cruise ship passenger then decided to sue other people, the people who had installed the gangway as well as um, the ship's master. The question arose whether those people who were being sued could rely on the limited liability clause in that original contract. That means the contract between the passenger and the cruise line. In that case, they were not able to rely on it because it didn't have what later became known as a Himalaya clause. So a Himalaya clause is a contractual provision conferring a benefit. Now, usually that benefit is exclusion of liability on a third party. That's basically what it means. There's also an exception where collateral contracts are concerned, and this is a general exception. Now, we have a very illustrative case on this, which is Shanklin Pier and Dettel Products. Now, Shanklin Pier, as the name suggests, was a company that operated a pier, and they wanted to paint their pier. Now, of course, a pier is um, exposed to the elements, and so they wanted to make sure that the paint could withstand the elements, in particular the water. So they got in touch with a company called Dettel Products and asked about the appropriate paint that should be used. Dettel told them they should use a particular paint. And after that, Shanklin asked their contractors, the painters, to buy that particular paint from Dettel, which they did. It turns out that that paint was not fit for purpose. And so Shanklin attempted to sue Dettel. Dettel argued that there was no contract between themselves and Shanklin simply because it wasn't Shanklin who went and bought the paint, it was Shanklin's contractors who had gone to buy the paint. The court said that this problem is overcome by way of collateral contract. That means the contract, which is the main contract, which is the contract for buying the paint between the contractors and dental product is one contract, but there's a collateral contract. And a collateral contract, we recall, is a contract that induces another contract. And the collateral contract here is the contract between Shanklin and Dettel, whereby because Dettel gave Shanklin particular information, Shanklin then instructed its contractors to go and buy this paint. So that first contract, the collateral contract, induced the main contract. And hence, strictly speaking, there was a contract, and so Shanklin was able to sue. Now, generally, some legislation, such as rights of third parties, for instance, in the UK, in the Caribbean Commonwealth, there um, are no such rights of third parties uh, acts. But sometimes we know that there may be such acts. In the UK, there is such an act. And the legislation would explain under what circumstances a third party may be able to sue. Usually, this would entail the third party knowing that they're a beneficiary on their contract and having being unambiguously named and there's no problem with intention and so on and so forth. So sometimes legislation can overcome any problems to do with privity. And uh, there's also, apart from rights of third parties acts, there's other types of legislation such as legislation on insurance whereby uh, third parties may be able to sue an insurance company similarly to what we saw in the Trident insurance case, although that of course was decided on the basis of common law, but sometimes we know there may be legislation that helps us out in these 
types of situations. Now, because of these problems posed by the doctrine of privity, um, which of course we know evolved in the 19th century, because before that we only had the first rule to do with obligations, and then since the 19th century we've had both rules, obligations as well as benefits. Now, one way to overcome that was to use the trust instrument. And so this is exactly what happened in the Afflateur Réuni and Leopold Wolford. What happened here was that the, um, there was a company that were ship owners, and they had chartered out their ship to a company who, well, chartered their ship. And the um, arrangement had been organized by a chap called Leopold Wolford. Now, the contract between the ship owners and the charterers mentioned that the ship owners had to pay the um, broker, in this case Leopold Wolford, a share for as a fee for his work. The ship owners, because the ship was repossessed because they, of World War I, they refused to do so. And they claimed that uh, Leopold Wolford was not privy to the contract between the ship's owners and the charterers. And the court came up with the trust argument. Basically what they said was that this money that was payable by the charterers to the ship owners contained a part which the charterers were holding on trust for the broker, for Mr. Walford, and that is how the situation was resolved, and therefore he was entitled to his money. Now, we could potentially use the trust argument, that means money being held or something being held for the benefit of a, another party, we could potentially use that in all types of situations and thereby frequently overcome the rules of privity. However, the subsequent case of Reeshebsman basically put a stop to that because Reeshebsman was a case where the court held that we can't just say it's a trust and hence we overcome privity. In order for it to be a trust, it must conform to the rules of a trust, which of course we do not discuss as part of this course, but there are requirements. And unless you fulfill those requirements, it's not a trust. And if it's not a trust, then you cannot say that you've overcome the rules of privity. Then it's just a contract and the rules of privity apply. So what happened in Shebsman was that Mr. Shebsman retired and he uh, made an agreement with his company whereby he would receive a sum of money and upon his death the company would keep paying a sum of money to his daughter and to his wife and then once he died the company refused to pay and of course argued that there was no agreement between the company and the daughter and the wife which of course was true so they um, tried to the wife and the daughter tried to overcome this by way of trust and the court held that Mr. Shebsman had not established a trust he had simply agreed a contract and you cannot overcome privity simply by calling a contract a trust. Now lastly, we have two cases involving covenants and injunctions. Um, the first one is Smith and Snipes Hall Farm and River Douglas Catchment. What happened in this case was that a company had been hired to secure the rivers, a bank, the banks of a river against flooding because there was a farm that um, was right uh, on the river banks and Unfortunately, the company hadn't done a good job, and then there was indeed flooding. Now, the farm had been sold in the meantime to a new owner, and the question arose whether the new owner could sue upon that contract. And, of course, they were not privy to that contract between the original owner and the company that was supposed to have secured the banks. But the court held that this was a covenant that came with the property, and it passed to new owners of the property. Therefore, the new owners were able to sue. So rights, benefits under a contract can indeed pass to new owners in these types of circumstances. And lastly, in Talc and Moxe, this is the one exception to the first rule of privity that I had alluded to earlier. Um, in that case, there was a covenant that came with a piece of land, and the covenant basically stated that the... Um, garden that uh, the um, land was attached to, the, the, the property was attached to, had to be maintained. And one of the subsequent owners refused to do so. And here the court held that 
because this obligation to maintain the garden went along from one owner to the next to the next, therefore the uh, subsequent owner did indeed have to maintain the garden. So here you see there's an obligation which was originally established at some point which then passes along to new owners. So this is probably the only exception you'll find where the first rule of privity can be overcome. Um, however, of course, this is not uh, terribly unfair because if you buy a property, you will know what obligations come with that property because they would be listed. Lastly, let us summarize then what we've learned about the doctrine of privity. Essentially, the doctrine of privity consists of two rules. The first rule is that Two parties, A and B, to a contract cannot impose obligations on third parties as part of their contract. A contract between A and B cannot impose an obligation on C. The second rule is that two parties cannot confer benefits on a third party. So a contract between A and B cannot confer benefits on C. We had the famous case of Twedlin Atkinson, where in particular the second rule was firmly established. And then the later House of Lords case of Dunlop, Pneumatic Tire and Selfridge, where this was confirmed. We had a number of exceptions that we looked at, collateral contracts, agency, legislation in general. So we always look out for potential legislation that may overcome the doctrine of privity. And then we had trusts and restrictive covenants and injunctions. Thank you very much for your attention.